Welcome to ID the Future, a podcast about intelligent design and evolution. Greetings and welcome to the ID the Future podcast. I'm Casey Luskin, broadcasting from Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture in Seattle, Washington. This podcast will give a response to the recent YouTube challenge to the Discovery Institute, and I've titled this response, Does Any Critic Out There Understand Intelligent Design? Any critic making the inaccurate claim that Stephen Meyer is the, quote, president of the Discovery Institute, unquote, is bound to be fairly uninformed about both intelligent design and the Discovery Institute. Thus, when I recently viewed a YouTube video making this very mistake while allegedly, quote, challenging the Discovery Institute to discover, unquote, I first thought, why should I accept a challenge from someone who can't even correctly discover the identity of our organization's president? Regardless, this video that recently appeared on YouTube was enlightening, but not in the way that its authors intended. Rather than posing any difficult challenge for ID, the video unwittingly exposes the unfortunate ignorance that apparently abounds regarding the nature of the theory of intelligent design and how we detect design and test for it in nature. In this regard, I view this response to the video as an opportunity, hopefully a teachable moment, for the 40,000 plus people who have apparently viewed the video on YouTube and the handful who have emailed us regarding it. That is, it's a teachable moment for those who are interested in learning. The basic problem with the video is that its challenge woefully misunderstands intelligent design and the logic by which we infer design. It claims that ID only claims that a gene is, quote, unambiguously designed, unquote, when we find that, quote, one, no homology for other genes exist, or two, no alternative or prior function exists, unquote. Each criterion makes an extremely poor test of ID, for design structures often appear in similar forms in different designs, and design structures can also have multiple functions. Let's examine these two contrived criteria in turn. Firstly, why must design structures be unique? Regarding this first criterion, the homology criterion, the video claims that homology is found with at least 20% sequence identity over at least 100 amino acids, which would have an odds of less than 1 in 10 to the 28th of happening by chance. There's actually much debate about what constitutes homology and what a non-arbitrary measure of homology should look like. For example, Teichmann and Vita, in their 2004 paper in Genetics, suggest that homology should not be inferred when there is less than a 60% sequence identity. If this is to be the measuring line, then many claims of protein homology, including the claims in this video, would be in jeopardy. But for the sake of argument, we'll take the video's definition of homology. The video's argument effectively says that a gene must lack any known homologue and thereby be completely unique, basically an orphan gene, in order for us to claim that it was designed. But why must this be so? The video's first criterion for detecting design seems eminently contrived and unreasonable as a test. As I explained in my recent primer on the tree of life, designers commonly reuse similar components in different designs because they are effective at performing a common function. As I wrote, quote, Why not consider the possibility that biological similarity is instead the result of common design? After all, designers regularly reuse parts, programs, or components that work in different designs, such as using wheels on both cars and airplanes, or keyboards on both computers and cell phones, unquote. In this regard, we might actually expect to find similar proteins and genetic components among living organisms if life were designed. If there is no known homology for a given gene, then that would dictate that the gene is effectively an orphan gene. The existence of orphan genes poses a problem for evolution, for from whence would such an orphan gene come? But the non-existence of orphan genes does not pose a problem for ID. After all, many critics are quick to remind that evidence against evolution does not necessarily therefore constitute evidence for ID. ID, after all, requires a positive case for design. Thus, these ID critics are testing ID inappropriately by trying to affirm ID simply by challenging evolution. When it comes to predictions about biological similarity, both common design and common descent predict that it might exist. Thus, the presence of shared functionally similar sequences between different organisms does not make a good test of discriminating between design and descent. Even leading evolutionists like Francis Collins recognize this point. Collins writes in The Language of God that genetic similarity, quote, alone does not, of course, prove a common ancestor, unquote. And that's because a designer could have, quote, used successful design principles over and over again, unquote. Collins is right. To show how the video's argument fails by analogy, if one discovers two Buicks in a junkyard, one would not conclude that one car descended from the other. Rather, one would conclude that intelligent engineers modified plans from the first Buick to make the second. 
In the same way, the genetic similarity of two different proteins in itself is compatible with either common descent or common design. So rather than failing to make a case unambiguously for intelligent design, homology fails to make a case unambiguously for common descent. Ignoring the possibility of common design, the video assumes that shared functional similarity necessarily indicates common ancestry. This video is simply applying what I called in my recent primer on the tree of life, the main assumption of neo-Darwinian tree building. As I wrote, quote, the first assumption that goes into tree building is the basic assumption that similarity between different organisms is the result of inheritance from a common ancestor. That is, except for when it isn't. And then the similarity is purportedly said to be the result of convergent evolution, etc. But even if we take this claim at face value, that similarity between different organisms is the result of inheritance from a common ancestor, let's recognize it for what it is, a mere assumption. But are there other possibilities? Unquote. As for those other possibilities, Michael Behe explains in both The Edge of Evolution and Darwin's Black Box that mere similarity is not enough to infer that a feature was produced by the neo-Darwinian mechanism of natural selection acting upon random mutations. As he states in Darwin's Black Box, quote, Although useful for determining lines of descent, comparing sequences cannot show how a complex biochemical system achieved its function, the question that most concerns us in this book. By way of analogy, the instruction manuals for two different models of computer put out by the same company might have many identical words, sentences, and even paragraphs, suggesting a common ancestry. Perhaps the same author wrote both manuals. But comparing the sequences of letters in the instruction manuals will never tell us if a computer can be produced step-by-step step starting from a typewriter. Like the sequence analysts, I believe the evidence strongly supports common descent, but the root question remains unanswered. What has caused complex systems to form? Unquote. Or as Behe wrote in The Edge of Evolution, quote, Modern Darwinists point to evidence of common descent and erroneously assume it to be evidence of the power of random mutation. Unquote. These critics in the video are thus mistaking sequence similarity as evidence for the neo-Darwinian mechanism of natural selection acting on random mutations. I would go even further than Behe and argue that when we consider the possibility of common design, functional similarity, i.e. sequence homology, does not even provide unambiguous evidence of common descent over common design. After all, to reiterate what Francis Collins admits, genetic similarity alone does not of course prove a common ancestor because a designer could have used successful design principles over and over again. Now on to criterion number two, repeating Ken Miller's errors. When you only read the arguments of critics, sometimes you begin to think that they have the monopoly on a subject. This must be the case for the YouTube video's creators, who mimic Ken Miller's straw man test for irreducible complexity by stating, quote, we don't want some protein that is used lots of ways or it can't be part of an irreducibly complex system, unquote. What? These guys must be learning about ID from Ken Miller and not from ID's proponents. Miller has made similar arguments like this many times, misrepresenting intelligent design, and I wrote a lengthy response to Miller on this point in 2006 in an article titled, Do Car Engines Run on Lug Nuts? A Response to Ken Miller and Judge Jones' Straw Tests of Irreducible Complexity for the Bacterial Flagellum. To repeat Miller's assertion, he testified during the Dover trial that irreducible complexity is refuted if one subsystem can perform some other function in the cell. Miller stated, quote, Dr. Behe's prediction is that the parts of any irreducibly complex system should have no useful function. Therefore, we ought to be able to take the bacterial flagellum, for example, break its parts down, and discover that none of the parts are good for anything except for when they're assembled in a flagellum, unquote. The question becomes, how is Behe's argument for irreducible complexity different from that of Ken Miller's and this video? Behe actually formulates irreducible complexity as a test of building the entire system. Irreducible complexity operates on a collection of parts, not each individual part. Behe discusses and defines irreducible complexity as follows in his book Darwin's Black Box, writing, quote, in The Origin of Species, Darwin stated, quote, If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down, unquote. A system which meets Darwin's criterion is one which exhibits irreducible complexity. By irreducible complexity, I mean a single system composed of several well-matched interacting parts that contribute to the basic function, wherein the removal of any one of the parts causes the system to effectively cease functioning, unquote. 